The next morning was a blur as I tried to process the events of that first night. It felt like a dream, a bizarre nightmare that left me questioning my sanity. I used all the free time I had to search for clues, details, or any information about Necropolis. But I only found two references about them online. The first was a news article written on June 19, 2009. It detailed how Necropolis was once a privately owned cemetery that belonged to the Abaddon family. An immigrant family that came to our town sometime after World War II, but vanished without a trace on June 13, 1955. Only their youngest daughter was found badly bruised and malnourished right outside the gates of the cemetery. A day later, the cemetery was burned to the ground, and all that remained was buried in a mass grave by the locals for fear of awakening any demons. Many theories arose, ranging from a kidnapping to a supposed cult sacrifice to a suicide-homicide situation. But to this day, the disappearance remains a mystery. Using the information I learned from the first reference, I tracked a user profile on social media with the name of Molly Abaddon. Her profile didn't have any information whatsoever. She had no likes, posts, and was following no one. Her profile banner and icon were the default ones you'd automatically get when creating a profile on this page. However, she was being followed by a single account with the name Molly Brown. That profile had posts, comments, likes, and whatnot. The latest post was a picture of a cute puppy posted just two days ago. Doing more research on public databases, I found out that there was only one person within 300 miles whose last name was Abaddon. At least that is what her last name was before she got married and changed it to Brown. The person I found was a 76-year-old widow. So, it matches up with when the Abaddon family came to this town. Skimming through the profile I found, I pieced together where I thought she lived. Now yes, I know that is very invasive of me, but I need to know more about Necropolis and it doesn't require a genius to know that this person is related to the cemetery and its history. I sent Molly a friend request, and waited for her to accept or decline it. I eventually dozed off for a few hours before awakening to a knocking on my front door. I checked my phone. It was 9.24pm. I hadn't ordered anything. So, who could be at my door, I wondered. I waited a few moments before the knocking stopped, and a white piece of paper slid underneath my door. I picked up the paper, and on it was written, Make any further contact with her, and there will be unpleasant repercussions. The words on that piece of paper sent a shiver down my spine. No doubt whoever had left this message knew about my research into Molly Abaddon and her connection to Necropolis. My mind raced with thoughts of who could have left this warning. Was it Mr. Damien? Was it someone else involved with the mysterious occurrences in the cemetery? The idea that someone was watching me, monitoring my actions, filled me with a deep sense of unease. I stared at the message, my thoughts racing. I knew I needed to be cautious, to tread carefully. Whoever was behind this was clearly intent on keeping secrets hidden, and I had inadvertently stumbled upon something much bigger than I could have imagined. 
The feeling of being trapped, of being entangled in a web of mystery and danger closed in around me. I felt as if I were a chess piece trapped in a game. I was weak, and it seemed as if I had no control over what I could and couldn't do. How did they know that I wanted to contact Molly? The more I thought about it, the more questions arose, and the more I regretted accepting the job. Do I take the risk and contact Molly? Or do I abide by their rules like the pawn I am? Do I leave this pathetic town I live in and attempt to escape from it all? Or do I uncover the truth of Necropolis? My mind raced to find a solution, and by the time I thought of an idea, it was already time for my next shift. I decided that whatever the history of Necropolis is, it would be my job to warn others about it and possibly put an end to it. I was already too deep, so I may as well take this entire place and its history down with me. Eventually, I gathered my courage, and I found myself once again driving through the forest towards Necropolis. The memory of the tall bald man and the weeping girl haunted my thoughts. The eerie melody of the organ lingered in my mind, and the note I received kept reminding me to tread carefully. I parked my car and started at the entrance gates, my heart racing. I knew there was no turning back now. I entered the cemetery to find Mr. Damien waiting by the door of the guardhouse. I hesitantly made my way toward him. All the while, thoughts of the note occupied my mind. The few seconds it took to reach Mr. Damien felt like an eternity. And his presence was just as unsettling as the first time I met him. He greeted me with a nod. His lips curling into a faint smile that never reached his eyes. That was the first time I saw his face display any sort of expression. Remember the rules, Mr. Ingram. He said, his voice like a whisper that seemed to echo in my mind. Follow them to the letter, and you will be safe, unlike the guard. Who relieved you of your first shift. A slight yet mischievous smile started to develop on his face. I nodded, my throat dry as I replied. Yes, I understand. With that, he turned and walked away, disappearing beyond the gates of the cemetery. I watched him go, a feeling of dread starting in the pit of my stomach. I took a deep breath and stepped into the guardhouse, the weight of the unknown pressing down on me. My mind repeated his words. Remember the rules, Mr. Ingram. Follow them to the letter, and you will be safe. Unlike the guard who relieved you of your first shift. No doubt, that guard got killed. But, in what way, I hope to never find out. The guardhouse felt even smaller this time, its walls closing in on me. I changed into the security guard outfit and picked up the piece of paper. The words now etched into my memory. The rules were bizarre, nonsensical even, but I will follow them, no matter what. As the clock struck 10 p.m., I settled into the chair, my eyes fixated on the vintage radio. I hesitated before turning it on, and this time, the crackling static 
felt like a familiar companion. The eerie sound seemed to fill the guardhouse, mingling with the tension that hung in the air. I tried to distract myself by staring out the window, my gaze fixed on the chapel in the distance. The memory of the previous night's event flooded my mind, and I shivered despite the warmth of the room. How had I let myself get into this situation? As per rule one, I walked out of the guardhouse and into the chilling cold outside, patrolling the grave sites and ensuring that there were no visitors on this side of the gates. I made my way back into the guardhouse once the cemetery was free of outsiders. Minutes turned into hours, and the air grew thick with anticipation. Every creak and rustle seemed magnified, and I found myself jumping at the slightest sound. I glanced at the clock. My heart sank as the hands inched closer to 1 a.m. I got out of the guardhouse when I first saw him again, the bald man. I walked to the gates of the cemetery and let him in. Just like last time, he made no noise, had his eyes transfixed on the chapel, and he didn't seem to acknowledge my presence. I made sure to stay out of his way and not talk to him as he entered the chapel and closed the door behind him. Instead of going back to the chapel, I made my way to the mausoleum. The tall structure stood before me, and I felt weak, small, and scared as hell. It felt almost like I was staring up at my creator. I unlocked and opened the door to the mausoleum, and with a heavy gasp, I made my way in. I closed the door behind me before beginning to look around inside. I didn't know why I was there, but it felt like the right decision. I was looking for something, but I didn't even know what it was. I read the golden plaques affixed on top of the sarcophagus. They had the names, dates of birth, and dates of death of the bodies entombed within them. I read the last one when I made a realization. None of the sarcophagi housed a person who died past 1955. The most recent date of death I read was on June 10th, 1955, just three days before the Abaddons vanished. Suddenly I heard a noise. The organ's haunting melody began to fill the air. This time, it sounded sad, tragic, as if it were telling a mournful story. On the first night, it sounded eerie, like a warning. This time, it sounded like a goodbye. Its mournful notes sent shivers down my spine. I clenched my fists fighting the urge to run. I remembered the rules, to stay away from the chapel during this time. Fortunately for me, the mausoleum isn't that close to the chapel. I walked around the interior for a bit, searching for anything out of the ordinary. When I found it. A single stone slightly extending outside of the wall facing the entrance of the mausoleum. This seemed odd to me because the mausoleum was perfect. That wasn't an exaggeration. The place was perfect. Apart from this one stone, the place felt almost too perfect. It was too clean, too new. The smell wasn't good nor bad. The linings and drawings on the wall were perfect. Every centimeter of the structure was perfect. Apart from that single piece of stone sticking out of the wall. 
My heart raced as I stared at the protruding stone. It seemed out of place in the sea of pristine perfection that was the mausoleum. I knew instinctively that there was something hidden behind that brick. Something that wasn't meant to be discovered. I hesitated for a moment, the tragic organ music echoing in my ears. The rule never stated anything against me entering the mausoleum unless I heard noises coming from within. Fortunately for me, the only noises in this structure were my own. Either way, my curiosity got the better of me. With a mixture of fear and determination, I pushed on the brick. Feeling slight resistance before it gave way and slid into the wall. The title was embossed in faded gold letters. Chronicles of Necropolis I hesitated, my fingers hovering over the book. The sense of danger was palpable, and I felt as if I were on the precipice of uncovering something far beyond my mortal comprehension. I knew that reading this book will probably reveal secrets that were meant to stay buried. But my curiosity was insatiable. With trembling hands, I opened the book to its first page and began to read. The entries were written in an elegant cursive script, dated back over a few decades. The tales within spoke of rituals, sacrifices, and a pact made with dark forces in exchange for wealth, power, and longevity. As I read, I began to realize the true nature of Necropolis. It was not just a cemetery. It was a nexus of spiritual energy. A place where the boundary between the living and the dead was thin. The Abaddon family, driven by greed and ambition, had made a pact with an entity known as the Keeper of Souls. The entity granted them the means to accumulate wealth and power in exchange for the souls of the deceased buried within the cemetery. Over time, the Abaddons had used the souls to prolong their lives, ensuring their immortality while causing suffering to those whose remains were bound to Necropolis. The rituals conducted in the chapel were not just for show. They were part of a larger design to maintain the link between the living and the dead, to harness the energy of the souls and fuel their twisted desires. Eventually, not enough souls were available to be harnessed by the Keeper of the Souls. So he took most of the family souls and only left Molly alive. Badly bruised and malnourished as a warning for others to heed. The land Necropolis once stood on was eventually bought back by someone who reconstructed and reopened the cemetery. The book doesn't say who that person is. The more I read, the more I realized the magnitude of the darkness that had enveloped Necropolis. The weeping girl I had encountered, the apparitions, and the haunting melody of the organ. They were all connected to the malevolent power that lingered within the cemetery. As I delved deeper into the pages, I learned of the curse that had been placed upon the Abaddon bloodline. The curse ensured that they could never leave Necropolis, bound to the very place they had profaned. The Keeper of Souls had turned them into eternal guardians of the cemetery, cursed to protect the dark secret they had unleashed. My heart raced as the truth settled over me like a suffocating shroud. I had unwittingly stepped into a battle between the forces of darkness and those who sought to free the trapped souls. The warning I had received, the veiled threats, it was all a desperate attempt to keep the truth hidden. 
With every page I turned, I realized the magnitude of my role in this story. I was not just an observer. I was a potential disruptor of the twisted balance that had been maintained for generations. I could be the key to freeing the souls trapped within Necropolis. Or I could be the catalyst for even greater suffering. Or I could also be the next to join the suffering. My mind raced, my heart pounding in my chest as I read further into the Chronicles of Necropolis. The truth was like a weight on my shoulders, and I felt the gravity of the decision I had to make. I had a hard choice to make, a choice that could determine the fate of the souls trapped within the Necropolis and my own destiny as well. Would I risk my sanity, my life, and my soul to free those who once rested easily? My heart sank as I thought of my options. No matter what I did, I had to do it soon. Hastily, I took as many pictures of the pages of the book as I could before I returned it to where I originally found it, making sure to place the stone hiding it in its place as well. I then left the mausoleum and locked the door behind me before returning to the guardhouse. All the while, the organ inside the chapel played a glum tune that echoed within my head. As the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. That the very darkness itself was alive with hidden eyes. The words of the book echoed in my head. The stories of rituals and curses. I had become a part of something beyond my understanding. A battle between supernatural forces that I had never believed in. I glanced at the clock. My heart sank as the minutes ticked closer to 2 a.m. The dread grew within me, and my mind raced with thoughts of the weeping girl and the disfigured man. Rules 5 and 6 played out in my head, and I knew that my actions could have dire consequences. As expected, right as the clock ticked 2 a.m., a soft knock on the door of the guardhouse made my heart jump. I hesitated, unsure of what I would find on the other side. I slowly approached the door, my hand trembling as I reached for the handle. With a deep breath, I swung the door open, revealing the figure before me. It was the weeping girl. Just like on my first shift, her face obscured by tears, her sobs echoing in the stillness of the night. She looked at me with pleading eyes, and my heart ached at the sight of her torment. I had a choice to make, a choice that could alter the course of this night. Following the rules had brought me this far, but now I stood at a crossroads. Rule 5 instructed me to lead her to the mausoleum, to unlock the door and let her in. But was there another way? What if I could break the cycle? Defy the darkness that had ensnared her and so many others? The organ continued its mournful melody, the haunting notes growing louder in my ears. Time seemed to stand still as I grappled with my decision. My heart ached for her suffering. But the book's revelations warned of the dangers that lay within Necropolis. I decided to do as the rules said. I took the girl to the mausoleum, opened the door for her, and locked it after making sure she went in. I made my way back to the guardhouse while the organ subsided, and all I could hear was myself. I felt dreadful. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was a pawn in a malevolent game, my every move orchestrated by forces beyond my control. The air in the guardhouse felt heavy, oppressive, as if the very walls were closing in on me. I sat there, my thoughts a jumbled mess, the weight of my choices pressing down on me. The night dragged on, and the sense of unease never left me. 
The minutes stretched into hours, and as the first light of dawn began to break over the horizon, I knew that my shift was coming to an end. Yet the nightmare I'm trapped in wore on. At last, 6 a.m. came, and I was making my way to the entrance of the cemetery when something came to my attention. The bald man stood right outside the chapel. He held something in his hand as he looked directly at me. It was the book. He held the book I had found inside the mausoleum, and he was staring right at me. I made an attempt not to notice the book and nodded at him before turning to the entrance of the cemetery and unlocking it. I opened the gates of the cemetery, got in my car, and left to go home. On the drive home, I felt like I did something wrong. Only when I arrived back home did I remember. Rule 9 By 6 a.m., open the gates of the cemetery and wait for the next security guard to take over. Your shift is not over until the next guard arrives or it's 8 a.m. Do not leave the cemetery until the next guard arrives or it's 8 a.m. I checked the time. It was 6.31 a.m.